Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. It's Monday morning, November 1st, 2021. And we are ready for our Bible study. Today we are in Ephesians. I keep saying Ephesians when I'm talking about this book. We're in Ezekiel chapter 6 and 7 today. And so I see some folks joining on on the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring page. Venota, good morning. And there's the Owsleys. Good to see the Owsleys today. Hope everybody's doing well out there. Venota, tell us where you're from. I know you watch the stream, but I cannot remember where you watch it from. I see Connie over on the Near Churches page. Good to see you today. As always, if you have any questions or comments while we're going through our study, feel free to use the comment section, and I will acknowledge them when I see them. So like I said, we are ready for Ezekiel chapters 6 and 7, and we've read the commission of Ezekiel. Good morning, Gail. Good morning, Anna. We've read the commission of Ezekiel, the vision that he had of God in chapter 1 while he was in captivity. There's Diana. Uh, his being called to be a watchman for the house of Israel, chapter chapters 2 and 3, really. And then chapters 4 and 5, we studied last time we were together. Uh, talking about the siege of Jerusalem and what was going to take place. And chapter 6 and 7 kind of continue that thought on the uh, siege of Jerusalem. All right, got some more folks joining on. Lyle, good morning from Nebraska, eh? I, didn't, I don't think I knew that about you, Lyle. Good to have you. There's Mom. Brian is watching. Okay, Venota's watching from India. Well, glad you're with us here today. All right, Ezekiel chapter 6 and 7, and the specificity of the judgment is pretty plain here in Ezekiel chapter 6 and 7 as to the, I guess you'd say, to the nature the nature of the suffering that, that God's people were going to go through, but also the purpose behind all of it. The, in these two chapters, um, the judgment of God is portrayed in specifically in three ways sword, pestilence, and famine. And so as we talked about the other day, uh, you live in a walled city, the first thing that the enemy is going to do is shut your water supply off from the outside, whether it's a spring or a river or something like that. They're going to shut that off. They're going to, of course, your crops are typically outside the wall. They're going to, well, they're going to help themselves to that, perhaps even burn it to the ground, we might say. And so famine and pestilence, all right, disease is going to break out. You're shut up in a small city like that. No real good method of sanitation. Uh, disease. Well, then the sword, of course, too. They're going to attack. If you try to escape the walled city, they're going to kill you. So these three methods of, I guess I would say, ultimately divine punishment against God's people for their, for their specifically for her idolatry. Um, sword, famine, and pestilence. Those things are brought to the forefront here in uh, Ezekiel chapter 6 and 7. There's Barbara Madison. Good morning, Miss Barbara. Hope you're doing well. And Neil, also watching from India. Good to see you. All right, let's get started here. Chapter 6 is rather short. It's only 14 verses, but it, it again gets into a bit of detail about the the reasoning behind God's judgment upon His people. Now remember, the book of Ezekiel dates itself. You go back to chapter 1 and the first couple of verses. It's in the fifth year, it tells us, of King Jehoiakim's captivity. Well, his captivity under uh, brought on by the Babylonians started in approximately 597 B.C. And so we're looking here at approximately 592 B.C. when these events are being written about. And so there was one other event that took place after this to God's people at the hand of the Babylonians, and that was in 586 B.C. So Ezekiel is prophesying about these things that are, that are coming in just a few years and again, the reason why these things are coming against God's people. So that's where we are here in chapter 6. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward the mountains of Israel and prophesy against them and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. So the mountains are brought out in this, in this context, chapter 6 and 7. And what this has to do with, as you continue reading through the text, is the idolatry. So in the, in the Old Testament, you read of idolatry on 
in, in groves and on high places. They would worship gods in these kind of, I guess you'd say secluded, kind of hidden areas in, as it's referred to, the high places, um, where it might be out of sight. Some speculate, well, part of Baal worship to, so we read of Baal throughout the Old Testament, part of Baal worship was to worship the sun, and so they would get in a higher place so as to be closer to that god. You know, I don't know that I can verify that 100%, but it seems to make sense, particularly particularly with the language used here of these mountains of Israel. Hello, Sheila. Good to see you. So God's bringing judgment uh, initially, of course, by the word spoken by Ezekiel, but then, the again, the sword, famine, and pestilence that he would bring on. Uh, he says, I'll bring a sword against you. I'll destroy those high places. So if you want to read, like, Israel's... I guess you'd say the warning to Israel from God about these high places. Read Leviticus chapter 26, and it talks a bit about those. Uh, it might give you a little more insight as to what I was just talking about, about worshiping on high places and in groves and, again, secluded areas. You know, it's kind of interesting because Ezekiel and, and Jeremiah does this too. The text implies that Israel thought they could hide their idolatry from God. You know, they would hide it in high places, in groves, in, in side walls of dwelling places. And, and one of the things we learn throughout the prophets is, no, you, you can't hide your sin from God, your idolatry specifically here. So he's going to destroy their altars of incense. Verse 4, he's going to cast down the slain before the idols. Well, when you do that, you defile. If you take a, a dead person's body and you put it on or near the altar of where you're going to worship or offer your sacrifices to whatever God it may be, you've defiled that altar. And so God's going to do that to, to Israel's idolatrous practices here. Um, verse 5, I will, I will lay the corpses of the children of Israel before their idols, and I will scatter your bones all around your altars. In your dwelling places, the city shall be laid waste. And again, we have to keep in mind here that this is God speaking of his own people and the punishment that they face because of their unfaithfulness. And, and one, of the, one of the ways it's portrayed here is adultery, spiritual adultery these people were committing by worshiping these idols. And the ultimate conclusion of this, and we see this phrase a few times here, specifically in chapter 6, uh, and it's stated at the end of verse 7, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When, when these judgments are enacted, when all of this takes place, of course, obviously, they would remember what Ezekiel had said, but then it would be unquestioned that there's only one God. And, uh, you know, I think of like the, it's, it's recorded in Exodus 12, the, the ten plagues and all of that that happened against Egypt. And God talks about the, the judgment that he, brought, that he brought against all the gods of Egypt. There's no, there's no question, and there would be no question in the mind of the Israelites after this judgment that there is no other God. Um, yet, okay, so continuing back now to Ezekiel chapter 6, you, you get to verses 8 through 10, and you read about this remnant. So a remnant is a small part, obviously. There's going to, a, to be a remnant who would escape the sword among the nations when you are scattered throughout your countries, or throughout the countries. They'd be scattered by the captivity of the Babylonians. But those of you who will escape, those of you who escape, will remember me among the nations where they are carried captive. Now, of course, Ezekiel's already in captivity, and I've mentioned a couple of times that uh, Daniel and his three friends, they were victims of the captivity, but they were, they were part of this, what you would call the remnant, the faithful few who obviously were currently troubled by the sinful condition of Israel, but then then when they uh, get to where they were going by the hand of their captives, not only would people like Ezekiel and Daniel continue to prophesy and do their work, but there were always a faithful few that they knew that what was going on in Israel was wrong, was sinful, and that there would be consequences for that, but they would have a heart of, of penitence, a heart of repentance once they got to captivity. They will remember me among the nations where they are carried captive. Again, that's... Uh, chapter 6 here in verse 9, and I love this phrase here in the New King James in Ezekiel 6, 9. They're going to respond that way. The remnant's going to respond that way because I was crushed by their adulterous heart which had departed from me. It, that, it, that shows the, the emotion, the emotional response of God to their 
not just to the captivity and the, the physical suffering that they would have to endure, but the, the, their spiritual adultery, again, as it's referred to here, and how that affected God. And as the New King James and, and the King James as well indicates, it broke God's heart that they were unfaithful. And so they would loathe themselves for the evils which they committed, verse 9. It, it would, it would, it's like it would come to a full realization of what they had done once they got into captivity. And here's the, here again is that phrase in verse 10, and they shall know that I am the Lord. There's not going to be any question about that. So what do you do? Well, pound your fists and stamp your feet. This is uh, in, in that, what? Uh, in that culture, uh, expressions of grief were very oh, loud and out front. You know, in America, we try to, I would say typically, we try to hide the tears and, and suffer in quiet. Not so in this culture. Uh, mourning and sorrow and grief was very prominent, very pronounced. And so that's the idea here in verse 11. And so you're, you're expressing your grief publicly and say, Alas, for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword, by famine and pestilence. He who is far off shall die by the pestilence. So, you know, if you, if you escape the, the, what, the initial onslaught, the attack, and you survive that, well, you're going to die by the pestilence. He who is near, okay, if you hang around, you're going to die by the sword. And he who remains and is besieged shall die by famine. So if you're, in, again, enclosed in that walled city and your food and water supply is cut off, well, you're just going to starve to death. And uh, we've, we've talked about that a bit in the past videos, how that took place. So again, pe uh, pestilence, sword, and famine. And again, the phrase, verse 13, Then you shall know that I am the Lord. And then again, verse the end of verse uh, 14, Then you shall know that I am the Lord. But he's going to bring down the idols, their altars, all the high places, the mountaintops. And so that's why in the beginning of chapter 6, Ezekiel is told to prophesy to the mountains. He's addressing the idolatrous habits that Israel had adopted over the years and, and adopted because they, they became to be like the nations around them and accepted and worshiped their idols. So what chapter 7 then does is a, like a, you might say, an official proclamation of the end. And that, that word, the end, uh, doom, judgment, that's portrayed throughout Ezekiel chapter 7. And, um, well, verses 3, well, the end of verse 2. An end, the end has come upon the four corners of the land. So, you know, nobody's excluded from this. Everybody's going to be judged. And then verses 3 and 4, he talks about the end. He talks about his anger and judgment. And look at verse 4, you know, part of having a full understanding of who God is and, and who we should be in turn, I think is expressed here in verse 4. He says, My eye will not spare you, nor will I have pity, but I will repay your ways. And so God, He is portrayed throughout both Old and New Testaments as a God of justice. He's going to see that things are done rightly, but He's also going to, he's also going to come in judgment against unrighteousness and un, uh, in injustice. And so verses 3 and 4, in fact, are reiterated in verses 8 and 9. So this is a very emphatic point that's being made here from the word of the Lord, verse 2, that Ezekiel is to relay to the land of Israel. And uh, God is, he, he does not, his, his long suffering runs out. We know that. And he's going to bring a righteous judgment. And an interesting thing here in Ezekiel chapter 7 is verse 9. So let's read that. It says, My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. I will repay you according to your ways. Now, let me stop there for just a second. One of the main points, that, and I talked about this the other day, of the book of Ezekiel is individual accountability and responsibility. And here again, that's stated. I will repay you according to your ways. So that's number one there from verse 9. Your abominations will be in your midst. And here's number two. Then you shall know that I am the Lord who strikes. So throughout the Old Testament, you have God presented as, okay, the God who provides. Um, Genesis 22, when God provided a, a ram instead of Isaac, uh, the Lord is my shepherd. 
you have these statements throughout the Old Testament of Jehovah and then this secondary term that describes his nature. And it's typically, it's always good. Um, the Lord is peace. The Lord is strength. The Lord provides all of these different things. Well, here to his people, he is called Jehovah Maka. I am the God who strikes. And so again, this concept of judgment and justice, God's going to strike his own people for their adultery. Uh, verse 10 talks about a day of doom has come. So again, his he, they're, they're already in the midst of the Babylonian attack, Babylonian attacks and captivity. But there's coming another one that, that the city's going to be destroyed, the temple's going to be destroyed, and uh, it's going to be, those things are going to be brought to an end. Commerce is going to be brought to an end. You read verses 12 and 13, um, it's, it's going to affect them commercially. There, there's no defense. Their, their military might. And, you know, Israel had for quite some time been a military, what we would say today, a military powerhouse, a dominant world, uh, a dominant world power. Well, when it's the Lord who strikes you, again, verse 9, your, your, def, your, your, your commerce, okay, your, uh, what's the word, your, your market, your economy, it's not going to help you out. Your military defense, your military capabilities, that's not going to help you out when God is the striker against you. And so look at Ezekiel 7 and verse 16. Those who, will sur those who survive will escape and be on the mountains like doves of the valley. Well, how, how much defense is a dove? How, how powerful and, and uh, effective at, at saving its own life as a dove? Well, it's completely useless. It might fly away, but it's a completely harmless animal. And that's how Israel's condition is described when it, again, verse 9, when it's God who strikes them because of their spiritual adultery. Um, notice their clothing. Once this takes place, takes place, verse 18, they will be girded with sackcloth. Horror will cover them. Shame will be on every face. Baldness on all their heads. They're going to be in the midst of mourning because of the judgment of God that's come upon them. Uh, then beginning in verse 19, and, and this is one thing that Israel had done historically. They had tried to buy their way out of difficult situations, whether it was with the Syrians or the Assyrians or even the Babylonians. Their gold, uh, precious things, especially out of the temple, it offered no real protection against Nebuchadnezzar. Well, certainly God, you know, you can take your silver and throw it in the streets and your gold's going to be like trash. Uh, verse 19, your, your, again, your economy, your commerce, nothing is going to prevent this judgment that's coming upon you. And ultimately, here's what it leads to. Verse 23, make a chain. So I, I wrote in the margin of my Bible there, 2 Kings 25. Read 2 Kings 25 because that's the historical context of what we're, the actual time frame that we're reading about here. Jehoiakim's captivity but then also what occurs after Jehoiakim and uh, the, the destruction, again, of Jerusalem and the temple. So make a chain. This is the concept of being enslaved. For the land is filled with crimes of blood, and the city is full of violence. One, one person that I think of in particular <clears throat> is Manasseh, who was one of the kings of God's people. He reigned for 55 years. And the Bible tells us of the reign of Manasseh that he filled Jerusalem with blood from one end to the other. Now, we do know that once he was dethroned and himself taken into captivity, Manasseh repented. But it was too late. I mean, for 55 years, he was a violent and wicked king, and he wasn't the last violent and wicked king. But you can read 2 Kings 25 and read about this enslavement that occurred at the hands of the Babylonians. So verse 25, destruction. Verse 26, disaster. And this destruction and disaster, as you read the last three verses of Ezekiel 7, they're going to affect all classes of people. So notice this. Um, the prophets, the priest, and the elders, verse 26. The king and the prince and the common people, verse 27. Nobody is exempted from the punishment that's coming from God because of their sin and notice again in verse 27, I will do to them according to their way. So, once again, 
individual responsibility, and individual accountability. And according to what they deserve, there's your righteous judgment. According to what they deserve, I will judge them. And here again is this, this statement, then they shall know that I am the Lord. It will, be, it will be beyond any reasonable doubt that there is only one God. When they endure what they're going to endure at the hands of Babylon, there will be no question about the uh, sovereignty. Let's use that word. The sovereignty of God. It will be beyond question. All right, guys. Those are some heavy chapters because of the, the, the fact that God is going to wipe His people out. There will be a remnant. Again, chapter 6, verses 8 through 10. But the remnant is going to suffer just like the just like the unrighteous people, but they will they'll be delivered and they have hope because they they see the the condition that they have ended up in and and they understand how they got there and they turn back to God. <clears throat> but by and large, this is going to be a what we call a universal judgment on the nation of Israel, and it affects all classes of people, and there is no defense. There is no defense. I see a comment on the Near Churches page. Makes you wonder if this may not be what is in store for the U.S. Well, the fact of the matter is, you know, you look at the history of nations, and I think that's one benefit of us studying the prophets, because the prophets put out in very plain, um, in a very plain manner how God deals, not only with individuals, as we continue talking about Ezekiel, but how God deals with the nations at large. Every nation throughout history has has fallen and uh, has become more corrupt over time and, and, in a sense, falls under judgment. And, you know, there are folks who say that, well, God doesn't work that way anymore. I, I've yet to see that in Scripture where God has ceased operating in the kingdoms of men. Okay, you know, Daniel, one of the things Daniel tells us is, particularly in chapter 4, is the most high rules in the kingdoms of men and gives them to whomsoever he will. I, I'm not aware of anywhere in Scripture where we're ever taught that, that that came to an end. And so, you know, you do wonder. Uh, Sheila says, knowing the pattern of God to be patient until he brings down nations, one has to wonder how long he'll be patient with <laughs> So there's a, there's a similar thought on a different page. Yeah, that's, and that's just it. How long will God allow innocent blood to run through a city? I mentioned Manasseh earlier. Well, think about the innocent blood shed in our country every single day. All right, guys. Appreciate y'all being on here, again, on the church page, but also over on the Near Churches page. Always appreciate the comments and the greetings. Good to see everybody today. Uh, we'll pick up tomorrow, Lord willing. We'll come back and we'll start in chapter 8 and possibly do chapters 8 and 9, and uh, we'll go from there. But thanks for being on here today. And hope you have a good day. And that's it. Hope to see you back here tomorrow at 11 o'clock, and we'll pick up in Ezekiel chapter 8.